Hi, this is Dr. Bob Dannenhofer, uh, Public Health Officer in Douglas County. We're doing our Facebook update today on August the 7th. Uh, this is a chance for us to answer your questions. It's also a chance for us to try out new mask, mask technology. So I have my balaclava, but this is a kind of mask. It's from a company called Spider Tech, and it's made of this kinesiology tape stuff. I don't know. It's not uncomfortable because it moves with your face, but a couple things. One is you have to put it on every time you want to eat or drink. This could help with my diet, but I'm not sure it's going to work otherwise. And it sticks to your face, so I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I'm going to take it down. This is not going to be... Ouch. Okay, anyway, so that's how it works. I don't think this is going to catch on, but if anybody wants to try one, uh, give me a yell. Anyway, so Dr. Bob Denhoff for the Public Health Officer of Douglas County, uh, and we'll talk today. Again, if you have questions, put them in the chat section and we'll get there. We already have some questions that we've had over the week that we're going to go ahead and talk about tonight. As usual, we start with the COVID thing starting from the top and moving down. And in the world, this remains an incredibly active outbreak. You know, we're adding about a quarter of a million cases every day. And so now we're over 19 million cases and over 700,000 deaths. A really, really brisk pandemic. At 700,000 deaths is a lot. You know, if you look at how many deaths we had from, uh, from Ebola or how many deaths we had from SARS or how many deaths uh, we have from other kinds of illness like that, they're in the hundreds. So to have 700,000 is a lot. Still very, very active in the U.S., in Brazil, and in India. India is probably the most concerning is that they're having a rapidly rising number of cases and, uh, you know, have these great slums where this is spreading very quickly. Uh, in the U.S., uh, we are at 5 million cases, about 160,000 deaths, um, still adding cases at a slightly lower rate. In fact, I think over the last week, I would say that the number of cases we've had has sort of stalled in the high 50s and low 60s, uh, but we're continuing to add lots of deaths. And that's because deaths tend to follow cases by a few weeks. So remember, over the last few weeks, the number of cases was rapidly rising. I think we'll still see deaths rise over the next few weeks, but the hope is that is if the number of cases stabilizes the number of deaths, do, new deaths will stabilize. Uh, still very active in the U.S., in California, Texas, and Florida, starting to go down in Arizona. But now we're starting to see new hotspots in Tennessee, North Carolina, North Carolina, Missouri, and Arkansas. So, uh, we, you know, there's, there's a lot of worry out there. Oregon's been pretty stable, over 400 today, but generally between two and 400 cases a day. We're continuing to have more deaths in, in Oregon. Again, I think these deaths are trailing the increase in cases that we saw in early, in early July. Um, uh, Douglas County, still doing okay. 140 some odd cases. Uh, uh, about 90% of those confirmed, about 10% of those presumptive, and we will talk about presumptive, and about 10% of those being uh, presumptive, um, still just that one death. Now, again, that doesn't accurately, totally accurately look at the number of deaths. For example, one of the positive cases that didn't get counted to us was a trucker from Nevada who got diagnosed in Oregon, and then another person from a different state who uh, is in our hospital now, they don't get counted to Douglas County, so they don't make our statistics, but it certainly adds to the amount of disease that's here in the county. Um, we had a, a, a few cases this week related to travel, gatherings, workplace outbreaks. So again, this is where we're seeing it spread, and we would ask people to be very careful about travel. So let's go to your questions. So what risk is there eating cold food served by somebody not wearing a mask? Well, really, people who are serving food should be wearing a mask. We do not think there's a great risk from ingesting this virus. We think it has to be breathed into the respiratory mucosa. So this is in the low, low, moderate, high, and extreme risk. This would be in the low or moderate. So are, vented, are there vented masks that filter both ways? Yes. So most of the N95 masks, you wear them to protect you from other people or from noxious fumes. So the N95 mask that I have in my shop is when I'm spray painting. I don't want to get breathe in those fumes. So it vents, it, it filters on the way in, but then vents on the way out. So it's easier to breathe out. So if you're going to use a mask with uh, vents, 
you want masks that filter both ways. And there are some out there, but you have to specifically look, look for that. You can usually tell the valves that they have are these little butterfly valves uh, that basically pop off as you breathe out. And if you have that, it protects you, but it doesn't protect other people, which is, we think, the major use of the mask. Yeah, so what's the risk if we are wearing masks outside, but we are close to someone who isn't wearing a mask? You know, it's not, again, being outside is much safer than being inside. But again, being within two to three feet of anyone uh, who's not wearing a mask has some risk associated with it. Now, again, you don't have to be perfect with this, but you really don't want to be around people for an extended period of time who are just two or three feet away. Now, passing on the street, so I did a long walk today, so passing somebody on the sidewalk, I wore a mask. Most people, others weren't. I didn't consider that to be high risk at all. Yeah, so David says, could I clarify the conditions for K3 returning to school? What's the difference between the state and county metrics? Oh, this is really confusing. I was on a long call today and spent a lot of time with this, and I'm not sure that I fully understand because they added more exceptions. But I think, I think the answer is for K3, if the county is less than 30 cases per 100,000 per week, we have been all along, and the positivity is less than 5%, there was only one week where we even got close to that. All the other weeks we've been below that, then K3 throughout the county could return to school. For older kids, um, they present a little more risk because kids 10 and above seem to spread this disease a little bit more, although we'll talk about that. That, that may not be true too. But that uh, the older kids may spread it more. The older kids are a little bit hard to control and contain. And the older kids could learn online. It's I feel a little hard to imagine a kindergartner learning online. And so for that reason, the, the uh, Restrictions on opening 4 to 12 are a bit greater. And they would suggest that the count, that the state has a positivity rate of less than 5%. They're not there now and haven't been there for the last few weeks, but I think they will get there soon. The second is the county has a positivity of less than 5%. If we'll, we're, we're certainly going to get that if we get the third metric, which is less than 10 cases per 100,000 per week. Now, we were there until the 4th of July, We've been above that since the 4th of July, but we are this close to getting there. So this is the time now really to redouble our efforts. Careful about travel, careful about gatherings, careful about staying home when you're sick so that we can dip under that 10. Because if we can dip under that 10, then all of the schools in Douglas County could open. That would be great. Okay, so... Um, Two questions, the same here. Are there any standardization of how test results and cases and case outcomes are being reported? Yes. The second question is, um, what are the negative, previously presumptive mercy employees? I thought presumptive cases had some illness. So, all right. So when you have disease, um, if you have symptoms and you have a positive, very specific test for COVID, you are a confirmed case. That makes up about 90% of the cases we have now. I'll, I'll ask Nessa to give me the numbers. But that makes about 90% of the cases we have now. These are people who had symptoms of COVID and have a positive test. That's, those are the cases. I think everybody is counting those cases. So 90.6% of the cases we have are confirmed. There's about... 9.4% of the cases that are not concerned that we consider presumptive. Those presumptive cases are close contacts who've not yet had a positive test. So close contacts who have symptoms and have not yet had a positive test. And these are not just any symptoms. So there was something on the Facebook today that said, oh, I get a headache a little bit and they make me a case, presumptive case. No. You have to have you have to have one you have to have you have to have these four symptoms: fever, cough, shortness of breath, or loss of sense of taste or smell. Loss of sense of taste or smell is really, really, really uncommon. In fact, I don't know anybody who had it 
before COVID. I can never remember a patient saying, you know, doc, I've lost my sense of taste or smell, but a good number of people with COVID have that. And it's really remarkable because they remember the day they lost their taste, their sense of taste, and they remember the day they get it back. That is so weird. So if you are a close contact of case and you have that, I bet you you have COVID even if you have 30 negative tests. That is such a rare symptom. Dyspnea, which is shortness of breath. I mean, how many times have you ever had shortness of breath at rest? I mean, it just doesn't happen very often. So if you're a close contact of person and you have dyspnea, you are a presumptive case, or if you have that in fever, and in this time in this time of the year, not very many people with fevers. In fact, if you look at everybody who comes to the emergency room, less than one in 150 have those symptoms. So these are not common symptoms. So you have to be a close contact with a with a a known case, and have one of those symptoms, and then you're a presumptive case. So we looked at our presumptive cases over time, and you'll see that presumptive cases very frequently will go to confirmed. Because somebody calls in and say, you know, I was around someone who had the disease. I now have this cough and stuff. We say, you better get a test. Until we get those test results back, they're presumptive. About 80% of those who get tested are now positive. So now we're talking about 2% of 9%, so just a small fraction of people who've had symptoms and test negative. Now, I know there were some at Mercy that did that. They're getting tested again, and we'll see what their tests are. I mean, it is possible there was some other disease out there that looked like that. And this is nothing different than we do for every other disease. So I'll give you the example. I'm a pediatrician. We see kids with strep throat all the time. So mom comes in with her three kids. And she says, oh, they've all got fevers and sore throats and swollen glands. And they look at the first kid's throat and say, oh, my goodness, this looks terrible. Let's do a strep test. We do a strep test. And the strep test is positive, And we treat them with antibiotics. And then the mom says, well, what about the other two? You know, they live in the same house with them, and they have the same symptoms as this first guy. We'd say, I wouldn't say, well, geez, I don't have a clue what they have. I need to do a test. I say, well, they overwhelmingly likely have strep, and we treat, we don't test them, and we would treat them, and we would treat them. And when the mom gets home, she wouldn't say, oh, you know, the older guy had strep. I had no clue what the others had. I mean, she said all kids, all three kids had strep throat. And that's how we do it for almost every disease that's out there. You know, in a norovirus outbreak on a cruise ship, they don't get a poo sample from everybody on the cruise ship. I mean, they get a poo sample from a bunch of people, and then the other people with characteristic disease get that. Now, yes, it is possible that somebody who was a close contact to a case within the time got something else. They got some other kind of pneumonia or bronchitis. But it's so much more overwhelmingly likely than it's COVID. On the other hand, there are people with suspect disease. That is, they have other symptoms. They don't quite have enough fever to make it. They've got, they've got malaise, they've got body aches and whatever. Statistically, when you look at them, they're likely to have it, but we don't count them unless they have a positive test. And since the tests only have about a 70 or 80% sensitivity in the real world, most of them have over 95% in the laboratory, but only a 70 or 80% sensitivity in the real world, that's not surprising that there are going to be people who have the disease and who test negative. So I think the way Oregon does presumptives is exactly correct. And, uh, and at the most, it overcounts diseases at the most by 9.4%. I tell you, if we had, if I said there was 5 million or 5 million, 5.1 million people in the country with COVID, would it really make a difference? And we're treating COVID the way we kind of treat every other disease. So that's why uh, we're doing it. There is standardization in how the test results and cases are reported. So different states can report them different ways. There is a group called the State and Territorial Epidemiologists, epidemiologists who this is their job, and they come up with definitions. Oregon typically follows the state and territorial epidemiologists. There are some states that have either included more cases. I think New York has included more cases. And then other, a lot of other states have included less cases, like Texas. And so there may be a little bit of, of uh, more reports or less reports. I think what Oregon is doing is right in the middle and very, very safe. So Ryan says, I have lupus and I'm on hydroxychloroquine. I thought I heard you say that I can't get my pills now. So no, for people who are on uh, hydroxychloroquine for lupus and have been on it since before the 
since before the outbreak, you can continue to get your hydroxychloroquine. For new people who are prescribed, they have to show that they really have lupus, and they don't, they're not just winking that they have lupus and they really want it for that. But yeah, if you have lupus and hydroxychloroquine, you can still get your pills. Now, um, let's talk about hydroxychloroquine. How could we go a day without hydroxychloroquine? So still getting a lot of grief about hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug that's usually used to treat something like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. It's also being used to treat uh, malaria occasionally, although not much anymore. And it was initially thought by the Chinese way in the early that it might be useful. And they tried it on a bunch of people and decided it didn't really work. And then, for whatever reason, it has sort of got this following that people think it really works. There are five excellent randomized controlled studies out there. That is randomized meaning that some people get the medicine and some don't, on a basis of randomization, controlled, meaning that it's controlled with a placebo, that show, unfortunately, that it doesn't work as prophylaxis, doesn't work as early treatment, and it doesn't work as late treatment. Now, you do see, I, I got three forwarded me today of people standing up there saying, I've treated a bunch of people and they're better, and I just hope that's true because I would love to have another or something or other. But when you say, well, geez, why haven't you published this? I mean, it's not that hard to publish something like that. So this would be called a case report. Case reports get published very quickly. So you remember early on in this thing, I had this deal about anosmia and whatever. In one week, I got, I got the case report back from the New England Journal of Medicine, probably the biggest journal in the world, and they looked at the case report. And so you could get these done. And if people really, truly had this striking stuff, they really could in a week get it done. And so we have a further challenge today. So if anybody's got this great data, they can send it to me electronically. Not, not, not press reports of this or whatever. The doctors are actually of this data can send it to me. I'm a medical reviewer. We'll go through the data and we'll look at it. Nobody has taken anybody up on these requests. And so I always have to worry about these. It may be that these people truly are so busy that they don't have the time to do it. It may, or it could be something else. I don't know what it is. The other study that came out was a hydrochloroquine study from Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, a well-established hospital done by reasonable people. And what they did is they looked retrospectively over time from March the 10th to May the 2nd, they looked at 2,541 patients. And they looked back and they said, okay, tell us what happened. And they found, like lots of people, that older people and people with underlying conditions died at a higher rate than people who didn't. And that people got hydroxychloroquine died at a lower rate than people who didn't get it. And you say, well, that sort of suggests it works. However, when you look at the data, they didn't give hydroxychloroquine to the oldest patients. They didn't give hydroxychloroquine to the patients who had underlying heart disease. And because of that, those older patients who had more heart disease were much more likely to die anyway. And so there was a difference in mortality was really hard to know. So the authors of the study, the people who wrote the study, said, well, you know, this is intriguing. And what we should do is more randomized control studies to see if it works. And somebody says, well, should we just be doing this at our local hospital? And the guy said, absolutely not. These should only be done as part of randomized control studies. So if people want to use hydroxychloroquine as part of a, as part of a randomized control study, that's great. Now, they did not see at Henry Ford Hospital any cardiac toxicity because they excluded anybody who had cardiac illness. And they did an EKG beforehand, and they excluded anybody with something called a long QT syndrome. And long QT people are much more likely to get sick with hydroxychloroquine. So they did that. They excluded a bunch of people and saw. Now, I've got another one forwarded me today. This guy's taking care of 991 patients with hydroxychloroquine and has had nearly 100% success. And again, there's money on the table. This guy just needs to send me those records. Easy to do in this day of electronic records. And we can go ahead and analyze the data for him and find out what it was. The fact that a bunch of people have claimed this and nobody has taken anybody up on the idea of having an outside chart reviewer review them is a bit suspicious to me because when I've asked people other things and I say, well, look, I'm a chart reviewer. Can you send the charts to me? The answer always is sure. Now, usually they even pay me money to do it, but this I'd do this one for free if indeed this data was so good. Something suspicious when people won't do that. Okay, a lot more questions here. 
So as of today, how many people with COVID positive are there in Douglas County? So Vanessa's going to get me the numbers of the uh, confirmed and the presumptive. So what do I say to naysayers who say masks don't work because the uptake in cases since the mask update? Well, that, that's, that's a question. Um, people have looked at masks and looked at when masks were there and how masks were used. And that data suggests that masks actually have been incredibly effective in preventing spread. Now, of course, those studies are not necessarily cause and effect, but those temporal studies, mask use went up, transmission went down, for example, in Arizona and Texas, it really looks like the use of masks was one of the characteristics that led to decline. So I think masks work. I think all those people say it doesn't work. You know, they said, look, you haven't done a randomized control study. And I understand, you know me, I love randomized control studies it would be impossible to do a double-blinded randomized control study with a mask because a double-blinded randomized control study would mean the patient wouldn't know if they had a mask on. And if you had this kind on, you'd certainly know. Um, doesn't know they have the mask on, and the people observing them wouldn't know they have a mask on. Just no way to do that with a mask because it's obvious. Yeah, so Jackie says, has Douglas County's number of suicides increased since the end of March? Um... We have not seen that. Now, nationwide, there's been a real concern about an increase in, in, increase in unattended deaths. That is, they get to people's house and they're dead, and there's been an increase in unattended deaths. Usually, suicides in Oregon have been related to pills or guns or something more, um, more violent like that. We haven't seen that yet. But again, we're a small county. We do not have that many suicides. So... It's certainly something we worry about, right? Because we know that when people are depressed, they're much more likely to commit suicide. And suicides do, uh, you know, there are a lot of people now who are showing signs of depression. I saw a, a story on last night, you know, Michael Phelps, Michelle Obama, all these other people saying that this has really been hard on their mental health. So I, I, I plead with people who are having mental health issues to call their therapist, to call their doctor, to do the things to take care of yourself by going outside, getting exercise, those kinds of things that will help. In terms of drugs and alcohol, we do not know. We have not seen lots of drug overdoses, but uh, there are at least some anecdotal stories of people who are drinking alone, and drinking alone clearly is a risk factor for alcohol abuse. Yeah, so this is another question. Can the BCG protect against COVID-19? So BCG is a vaccine that people use for tuberculosis for many, 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 many years. Uh, and um, it's a French product from back many, many years ago. And the thought was that BCG could boost your immune system, help you fight COVID. There was a very good study in the Middle East that looked at people who had COVID and whether or not they had BCG. Did not seem to make a difference. Wish it did. Okay, so Vanessa's giving me the numbers here. So we have 149 total. 135 are confirmed and 14 are presumptive. Some of those presumptive have had so some of those presumptive are awaiting tests. Some of those presumptive have had negative tests and are awaiting a second test. And some of those presumptives are close contacts of a family member and they've chosen not to be tested. Two of those are elderly couples that both have the characteristic disease. One got tested and the other one says, well, I already know what I have. And so they've chosen not to get tested. And so some of those will stay presumptive forever. Hard to believe that a husband and wife living together, they both have cough and dyspnea, and they're really sick together, that they would have different diseases. I mean, really. I mean, they almost certainly have the same disease. And to consider that wife not to have the disease really would be like, unlike any other disease we do. Okay, so... Someone says there's been a lot of talk about six presumptive cases being negative to take them out of the numbers. And the story is once you're presumptive, you stay presumptive. Again, you're statistically likely to have the disease. Remember, these tests in real life are only about 70 or 80 percent sensitive. So if you had 10 people who were presumptive, and we've had far more than that, and they tested negative, they would still, some of those would still very likely have the disease once you're presumptive you stay a presumptive. Now those six at Mercy are being tested again and we'll see what happens on the second test. 
Yeah. So Bruce says, are there any studies on face shields versus cotton mask, and what's the recommendation? The recommendation is a face covering. And whether you choose a fashionable balaclava, whether you choose a face mask, uh, whether you choose a surgical mask, whether you choose a shield, I don't care which one you use, just use one of them. There is some suggestion that a surgical mask is, is the better of those four alternatives. Uh, that a, a well-fitted cloth mask is the second best, and the face shield may be a, 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 a third. On the other hand, this is guy from University of Iowa who's so into face shields, and you know, he gives like an hour talk a week on face shields, and he thinks actually face shields are better than that. The CDC has says we don't really know, and so they've come up with sort of this mamby pamby suggestion. The point is that if you make everybody wear a face mask, there are some people either because of claustrophobia, because of previous traumatic events, or because they have low flow, just won't wear a mask, and then they're not wearing anything. And so I think the Oregon approach, which is wear a face covering, balaclava, uh, uh, surgical mask, cloth mask, or face shield, whatever you're going to do is going to be much better than nothing. And we don't really want to be arguing with people about their claustrophobia or their previous uh, bad experience. The other thing, the other advantage of face shields is you really can see the lips. So I just met with the school tonight, and they were talking about their Spanish teacher. And so I remember in Spanish, um, when I didn't learn it very well, in junior high, the teacher had the most expressive mouth and lips. And she would have us try and mimic the mouth and lips. That would be really hard if she was wearing a mask. In addition, I had some old teachers say, you know, uh, by about the third week, I don't need to say very much to the kids. I just give them the side eye in the face, and they know that I'm telling them to be quiet or pay attention, whatever they're telling them to do. And that's going to be really, really hard to do. That's going to be really, really hard to do with a mask. So at least in schools, face shields, face masks, I think they're going to be fine. And I think overall, face shields, face masks, just wear something. I did see a bunch of people today flagrantly not using masks. That is a bit worrisome. You know, all of these times when we've had people have had cases and they've been, and they've exposed other people, they feel horrible that they've exposed. Oh, if I'd only known. And the answer is there's no way to know when you're in that pre-symptomatic phase. There's just is no way to know. And so rather than being reticent later, wear a mask before. So if the six presumptives aren't changed, doesn't that hurt our numbers for school opening? Well, again, presumptives and cases are, are you know, only 10% of our cases at any one time are presumptives. And overall, uh, the number is, is, is just a few percent. So, no, it's not really going to make a big difference. The big difference in the numbers are this travel. So this one travel case we think has had now 80 contacts in over a dozen cases. So that's really what does. It's the travel, the gatherings, you know, whether you consider these at mercy presumptive or confirmed. Yeah, you know, if the presumptive were 80% of our cases, you'd say, yeah, that makes a difference. They, they're, they're, as we said today, 9.4%. Uh, they're really not making the, really not making the difference here. Some of the other presumptives today are people just got sick today, haven't had a test yet. So I think of those 14 presumptives in the end, um, we're still not going to wind up with very many that are not confirmed, that are not confirmed by a PCR. Yeah, so Debbie says, when I speak about restricting travel, are I referring to outside Oregon or in-state today? Both. So I would look for hotspots. Any place that's a hotspot, you really, 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 really should think about not traveling. Again, in Douglas County, we have one or two or three cases a day. Look back over the last few weeks. One or two, three cases a day. The average in the, in the country for a county our size is 23. And these hotspot cases have 100 cases a hundred cases uh, sometimes in a day. So I would look for places that have over 10 cases per hundred per day. Again, that's five times the risk of being here in the county and be very, 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 very careful about traveling in those areas. In Oregon, those areas at this point would be um, Moro, Umatilla, and Malheur County. So unless you have a good reason to go to one of those areas, please don't. They would include the Yakima Valley, the Central Valley in California, much of Texas, much of Southern Florida, uh, Louisiana, and Arizona. Again, 
and I've used this before, we have had cases from Alaska, Washington, Utah, Idaho, Nevada, Arizona, California, Louisiana, Florida, and Michigan. I mean, this is where our cases are coming from, right? Our cases are, you know, we don't have very many sporadic cases. Sporadic cases would be a case where we say, geez, I don't know where they got it from. We have just a few that we're looking at. And again, those are usually from out of county. Um, so again, be careful about traveling to areas where there is a lot of disease. So those counties in Oregon, the Central, the Central Valley in California, much of the Yakima area in Washington, be careful. So what's my risk as an older teacher with an autoimmune disease if we reopen schools? So what I have yet to see and I would love to see would be your individual risk calculator. So for many diseases, we have an individual risk calculator. I mean, you could say, you know, I'm a male, I'm 64 years old, I never smoked, I have a cholesterol of this, my blood pressure is this. And they can calculate down to a tenth of percent what my risk of having a heart attack is in the next five years. And that then helps the doctors to know whether I should start on statins or something else. And uh, so it's great. I would love to see a COVID calculator, I haven't seen it yet, that would say, you know, I'm 65, I've got these underlying conditions, what's my risk? Because that could help inform. Now, the biggest, uh, the biggest predictor is age. Again, less than 40, risk is probably very low. Between 40 and 60, it starts to go up. Between 60 and 80, it goes up further. And then above 80, it's really high. So if you look at the deaths in Oregon, many of these are in people 80 and above. There are more than I'd like to see in people 60 to 80 and the occasional person less than 60. So, um, uh, so older. The second is underlying conditions, especially underlying conditions that put you higher. So if you are older, and in my view, older is 70 now. So if you're old, because I'm 64. So if you're older and 70 with an underlying condition, I think your risk is about 7%. Your risk of death is about 7% if you'd get it. That's pretty high. Again, remember, my risk of dying in an accident in this next year is one in a thousand. If I did a year of living dangerously, honey, I'm going to trade in my safe car and ride a motorcycle. I am going to go ahead and take up smoking for the year. I am going to go every weekend do a high-risk activity like skydiving, piloting a private plane, or scuba diving. My risk of dying in that year would only be five in a thousand, certainly more than it would be otherwise, but only five in a thousand. If we're saying that a risk here is 5%, that's 50 in a thousand. So it's 10 times more dangerous than the year of living dangerously. So you have to look at it and see. So I've talked to a lot of older, te- a lot of older teachers and older other people, nurses and others, who wonder what they should do. And I can't tell people what they would do. Some people say, well, 5%, that's a 95% chance of me living, and I'm just totally involved in, in doing this. I could never take a year off from school, in which case they would do it. Other people would look at a risk of 1%, and you say, well, that's 10 times the risk of me dying in an accident. I'm not going to do that. So I think you need to sort of look at what your risk would be and then decide what your risk tolerance would be. I've been shocked over the time that people's risk tolerance is really quite different and hard to predict. So if you're 70 and you've got an autoimmune disease, I would love to have the calculator, but I think it's about 7%. If you were 50 without an underlying disease, it would probably be 0.2%. And then so it's somewhere in between there if you're between 50 and 70 and no disease and autoimmune disease. Okay, a couple of new studies that came out this week. Um, one is about outbreaks at sport camps, in schools and camps. Yikes, there have been a lot of outbreaks at camps. So there were camps in the Southwest where more than half the kids got the, got the disease in one week, and they really screened people beforehand. And so we do think that this is spread among kids. The other thing that we're seeing is that now we can have very special laboratories that can actually culture the live virus. And the live virus means a virus that can really spread, and it's the live virus that spreads from one person to another. This RNA we've been looking for is evidence of the virus, but it doesn't tell us necessarily that the virus is alive. So you remember I said sometimes weeks into this, these you can still find the virus, but we don't think they're infectious. They're sort of like dead bugs on your windshield. 
These actually are now able to culture actual live virus. These are live viruses that are out there. And what they found is that kids and asymptomatic people have lots of live virus in their nose. And we don't know what to make of that because when we look at cases, you know, most of our cases we can trace back to somebody who was either symptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So we, you know, it's pretty hard to know if asymptomatic people are really spreading. It's pretty hard to know if kids are spreading, but it's clearly not because they don't have virus. Okay, a uh, personal note, last time there was somebody who called about their dad being on oxygen or whatever, and I spoke with them today, and their dad is 86-year-old man who's got COVID. He's been had it for about a month now. He's been in the hospital now for his third time, and his oxygen levels are just teetering. And this is unfortunately what we see in older people, is that they have such a hard time uh, doing this so frequently where they have repeated hospitalizations, uh, gasping for breath, being away from family. This is really heartbreaking. So this is Ernest Vick, who's down in the hospital down in, in San Francisco. So we should, be, we should be thinking about him and realizing that he's not alone. That in areas where there's a lot of disease, and again, we've not really had a lot of disease here in Douglas County, in areas where there's lots of disease, there are wards uh, with 5, 10, 15 patients just like this, older people struggling to breathe away from their families. Truly, truly heartbreaking. Okay. Yeah, so how will next week's announcement from, from, from the governor regarding rural exceptions affect our smaller districts? I saw a draft of those today. I don't think they're going to really, they're going to affect our, several of our smaller districts in the county uh, because it changed from, I think they're going to change from school district size to school size, which will allow some of our, some of our smaller schools to open. But I just saw a draft today, so we're going to have to wait till next week. So Veronica says, are there travel restrictions here in Oregon? So what's the update on closing the borders? Well, Veronica, this is a good question. Um, the governor hints frequently at closing the borders and doing quarantine. Really a tough thing. New York has really done it now, where they have people on the borders as people drive in on, through the tunnel or coming across the bridges to New York, or as they fly into the airports, they're taking their names and numbers, checking to be sure that they're going to quarantine before they do it. That's a massive undertaking, and we in Oregon have not done that yet. We are hoping, hoping, hoping that people will follow the advice, which is avoid travel, right? So this is avoid travel outside the county unless you have to do it. So if you've got a business thing, you got to do it, got to do it. But if you're there to just go to a family reunion somewhere else, don't do it. I heard just a heart-wrenching story today of an 80-year-old who had had family and friends come from all over the country for his 80th birthday party. A bunch of the people at the 80th birthday party got it, and he died. And so his 80th birthday party led to multiple illnesses and his death. This isn't going to be here forever, right? We are going to find an answer to this. Effective therapeutic, vaccine, something we're going to find the answer to. We're asking people just to delay those things for a few months. And this is hard for me. I haven't seen my grandkids since the spring. I haven't seen my mom since the spring. And this, But there's just no safe way for me to do it. We just have to hold off for a little bit until we get there. Because if I see my mom and greet her, and then three days later I get sick and think, crap, I was sick when I saw her. She's 90. I mean, she's got probably a 20% risk of dying should she get this. Okay, let's not be totally negative. There are good things people can do. I gave blood today. I, I encourage everybody to give blood. It doesn't hurt at all. And blood really is a life-saving resource. Um, if you've had COVID, you might be able to, to, to deliver convalescent plasma. We're going to talk about that. But for otherwise, you, you, you give blood and platelets for people who've got cancer and on chemotherapy and need replacement, for people who have anemias, for people who have trauma and have surgery and need the blood, or... Uh, or for people who have like open heart surgery and they need the blood. So please think about giving blood. It doesn't hurt. The people at, at the Red Cross are incredibly fast. It used to take a long time, I think, to donate blood. But now I'm in there and out of there in 31 minutes. So it's great. Um, other thing is we, we hear there are some watch parties for this thing. Hard to believe that this is how you spend your Friday night. But thank you for, thank you for watching. Now let me tell you about convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is the... Um, 
plasma, you get it from people who've had the disease, they have high level of antibodies, and then you give it to people and you hope to protect them uh, from the disease. So the Chinese started this back at the time, but by the time they collected enough of the plasma, they didn't really have any cases. In, in They've tried it in the US, they've given quite a few doses, um, like 20,000 of these doses, and they're looking at the results so far, the results show that it's perfectly safe. So convalescent plasma, absolutely safe. Not a tremendous benefit. I think the thought at this point is maybe there's a small benefit. Maybe there's a slightly less oxygen need. Maybe there's a slightly lower length of stay. Um, and so we'll see with time if it works. But since it's safe, no side effects, and it maybe has some benefit, it's reasonable to use. It's only being used in studies. So... I have no problem with any drug being used in a controlled study because that's how we learn in medicine where the things work. And I never had of anything negative if it doesn't work because you didn't know, that's why you tested it. We had a question also about T cells and, and how antibodies and T cells work together. It's really complicated. I'm not suggesting I know exactly how they work. But, um, but new germ comes in, the T cells... Uh, are kind of lymphocyte that are in your body that search out, uh, is all, are always there looking around for new, um, uh, new germs. They find these germs, they attach to the germs, and they try and figure out what the germs are, whether you've seen it before or whether you've not. If you've seen it before, it gives a message to the B cells to say, look, I've seen this guy before, make a lot of antibodies against it, and then you don't wind up without getting the disease. Because, for example, with measles, you have this low level of antibodies, but if I got infected with measles, my body would recognize that, wait a minute, I've seen this before, tell those factories to start producing a lot of antibodies, and within a few days, I have this big level of antibodies, and it would kill off the measles virus. So the hope is with this, we've seen that people get a lot of antibodies after they get the disease, but they kind of go away. The hope is that the T cells will remember that they've seen this and the T cells will remember and make more antibodies. The T cells don't always do that. So the T cells sometimes are stupid and don't, rec don't remember that they've seen it before. And that's why you can get some viruses again and again. So for example, with norovirus, you can get that again and again. And some of the other coronaviruses you can get again and again. So we don't know where T cells are going to fit in with this. The hope is that T cells will be smart. And if you've had the vaccine or you've had the disease once, it'll say, oh, I know what that is, and immediately produce enough antibodies to make you better. But we don't know yet. Okay, so um, when Mercy Department was exposed to the higher hospital at risk, including the cafeteria and all those places, so Mercy did a very good job of limiting this. This was limited to a non-clinical area, so I don't think there's any risk of being at Mercy. In fact, sadly, we were at Mercy last week when my wife was sick, and I think we, we, I would feel safe needing to go back if we needed to. So um, I don't have any big concerns there. The big concern is um, the big concern on um, at Mercy is a big, complicated place, right? I mean, the way hospitals work is that this doctor talks to this doctor and then sees a person in the emergency department. So hospitals could have lots of spread. I think in this case, Mercy's done a pretty good job in keeping this contained, and uh, I think this is just going to blow through. Okay, could I compare H1N1 to COVID? So H1N1 is uh, is a kind of flu flu virus that comes out. The H is the hemagglutin and the N is the neuraminidase. And there are a bunch of different kinds of hemagglutins and neuraminidases, and they combine to form a, uh, a flu vaccine. So H1N1 is a kind of flu. And it was, remember, the swine flu in 2008, 2009, or 2009 was so bad because it was a new combination that most younger people hadn't seen, so this really blew through. I was at Mercy at the time, and I was in charge of the clinical stuff, so I know a lot about it. So H1N1 blew through. We had a fair number of cases of H1N1, but not really a lot of disease, so not very many hospitalizations, just a handful of deaths, and it blew through. Throughout the country, we had a lot of cases. We had some deaths, 
but that the case fatality rate or the infection fatality rate is that is the number of people who had the disease to the number of people who died was about one in a one in about ten thousand they think in the end, but nowhere more than one in a thousand. Uh, since it was a flu virus, we got a flu test and a and a flu vaccine very quickly. So by that, even though it just showed up in the springtime, by that fall we had a very accurate test. We had a very accurate um, uh, vaccine. The vaccine was really good, and we had a very effective treatment, which was Tamiflu. And that's why the, des the death rate from that was low. Now, any death is tragic, but the hospital wasn't overloaded, and uh, we didn't have very many deaths. COVID, again, a new virus. They're RNA viruses, but they're not really related. In COVID, um, uh, we have had a lot more deaths than we ever had from H1N1, a lot more deaths, and a lot more wrenching deaths. So talking about uh, this fellow before, this 86-year-old had been in the hospital, a lot of wrenching deaths. Actually, one of the deaths that happened during H1N1 were young people who just came in the hospital and died in a few days. Those were tragic, obviously, but uh, much less deadly than uh, COVID. Remember, the overall infection fatality rate for this is at least six and a half times per thousand. So when people have looked and compared these, they said that COVID is about 20 times more deadly than H1N1. And that's, that, would, that would go along with how I remembered this. Yeah, so Amy says, do you think we will have a spike in wintertime with holidays coming? I certainly hope not. But there are lots of concerns that as we get to the fall, this will get worse. Most respiratory viruses are especially quiet in July and August. Flu nearly goes away. Um, the other kinds of coronaviruses you rarely see in the, in, the, in the summertime. But as the fall starts to come up, you see an increase in flu, you see an increase in RSV, you see an increase in metanumovirus, you see an increase in the coronaviruses, you see an increase in... Um, just all those things that happen in the winter, it's chapter out, all those things that happen in the wintertime. Um, the pro there are going to be two issues with this. One is that because these things increase, you might see an increase in COVID at this time. The other problem is it's going to be really hard to separate them. Right now, if somebody is sick, COVID is near the top of your list. But in the fall, when there's metanumovirus and RSV and all those things going around, it is going to be so hard to separate these out, especially when we have the testing that we have now. Most times we don't have to separate them out, right? So most times kids come in with a cold and they say you have a cold. I don't ever really do the testing to find out if it's coronavirus this or a metanumovirus or a, or a rhinovirus or whatever because it really doesn't make a difference. In this case, it would. So this is worry. The other worry is that in the fall, we're going to start opening um, colleges. I think colleges, as I said to somebody before, are going to be a cauldron of disease. I mean, college students, just by their very nature, congregate. They get close. They have all-night dorm parties. I mean, I know those things are going to happen. And they come from wide areas. They don't come just from that city. They come from all areas around. They like to travel. And because of that, I think college is going to be a real risk for spreading. The other risk for spreading is holidays. Right? So Thanksgiving is our number one travel time of the year as people go around and see families. And that's going to be a big concern. I mean, we saw a huge increase with Memorial Day and, and Fourth of July. And I never really think of Memorial Day or Fourth of July as big family reunion times. But we had a lot of family reunions those times. So I do think of Thanksgiving as a family reunion time. So that's why we really, really worry about, um, about the fall. And that's why we want to get this under control so that we're not dealing with so much disease in the fall that we can't stay on top of this. Now, I will tell you, other countries that have done previously a very good job on this are a little worried right now. Germany which had done a lot of testing and had really a low rate of disease. So Germany, a pretty big country, um, uh, was down to like 500 cases a day in the entire country. And over the last few weeks, they've seen increases in the cases, not much of an increase in the death rate, but an increase in the number of cases, again, because people are doing more moving about. And so just really cautious people, cautioned people 
on gatherings. Now, the good news is outdoor gatherings seem to be much safer than indoor gatherings. So again, you get a chance and you're going to have something. Do it outdoors. Don't do it indoors. It seems that the indoor stuff is many, 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 many times more dangerous than outdoor stuff. So if there's no friends you just have to see and have a meal with, as there might be, do it outdoors. We think, again, that's going to be much safer than doing it indoors. Uh, do it a little bit spaced apart. It's a little funny when you're having a meal with somebody and they're six feet apart. But it really happens, and, in, and if it's quiet enough, six feet apart is totally close enough. So more distancing, do it outside if you can, and think about, hmm, do I really need to do this, or could we just have a great phone call? Okay, what else we got here? Okay, so we still have uh, three challenges. The first is ways to improve reporting. We did get a report last week that people wanted us to include the school numbers. We did it. Um, we have a governor for day, and somebody said we should, if they were the governor for day, they would do travel restrictions. That's great. I would actually like that person who wrote that to me today actually come up specifically like, would you, how would you do that? Would you just encourage people? Would you just have an order? Would you have people at the borders stopping people saying, hey, I see you're from California. Where are you staying? Are you going to quarantine for two weeks beforehand? Would you do it even more rigorously like Australia, where, you know, Australia has the advantage of being an island, but when you land in Australia, they sort of take your picture. They follow you to the, to the uh, place you're going to stay. You cannot leave that room for anything. Okay, so so you're the governor for the order, so you ha governor for the day, so you have to write the order specifically. What specifically are we going to do? Where are we going to do it from? And when you're going to start? And then the third challenge is the fifty bucks for anybody who has the oh yeah, I got it. I got uh, a notification that I had positive results, but I never had the test. Again, that one's been really going around this week, and my fifty dollars is still in my pocket because nobody has been able to show me that. And it's usually a friend of a friend of a friend or a relative of somebody who has done this. And when they track it down, they, 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 they don't seem to be able to find it. And then the new challenge today is, again, these people who think hydroxychloroquine works great, beautifully have them get in touch with me and we'll, we'll arrange for a, a formal review and publishing of their data. I mean, really, if you had such good data, you'd love to be on the front page of the New England Journal showing how wonderful your stuff was. And we'll help them write that. We'll help them write the study. All right, is that what we got? That's it for the day. I thank you all. We'll do this again next Tuesday. Um, and again, this is Dr. Bob Danhofer, Public Health Officer from Douglas County. Thanks so much.